much and welcome to uh, this presentation sponsored by the Science Circle. We're going to be discussing the uh, Mola art and aesthetics among the Kuna people, which is a unique Native American art form from Panama. And of course, thank you again, uh, Science Circle, and thank you all for attending. Uh, we're in the middle of pandemic crisis and you've taken time out of your life to come hang out with us and hopefully I can help transport you into another world for a short period. Of time. The, um, before we get into the uh, Mola art, I'd just like to talk a little bit about the main ideas. Now, it was really difficult for me to decide what are the principal ideas behind these talks that I've been giving about indigenous culture. So this is what I've chosen to share with you. So if you think about it, history and organized religion uh, and writing is really only about 2,000 to 10,000 years old. 2,000 maybe in Europe and 6,000 years in some of the uh, other continents. So before that, for that, for hundreds of thousands of years, and uh, we can debate how old our species actually is, but some say 200, some say 800,000. So 400,000 years is a nice round number when you're dealing with such large numbers. We universally believed in spirits as best that we can tell. That is, in, in this prehistoric period, plants, animals, and natural phenomena was imbued with life, and they had an intention, and they could interact with humanity, and humanity talked to these spirits and solicited their assistance in their human affairs. So if you think about it, for that long period of time, as best we can tell, this is what human beings considered the nature of their world, their universe, and their cosmology. So the traditional people of the world, whether they're in Asia, Africa, or uh, South America, Central America, Oceania, they are caretakers of this sophisticated system of thought that is carefully encoded in a wide variety of cultural components such as art, music, dance, narratives, language, ritual, symbols, belief and subsistence practices. And we're just going to look at one of those components today, and that is art. And we often forget that this tradition powerfully impacted the evolution of culture and human consciousness. So those are my big ideas for what it's worth. So the folks that we're going to look at today are the Kuna. And you'll see the spelling is, is variable in the literature. First it was Kuna with a C, then it was Kuna with a K, and now it's Kuna with a G but it's all pronounced the same. Quite frankly, I think the Kuna people just like messing with us, so they change the orthography of their tribal name or their cultural name. But these are folks that live in the tropical rainforest. They're subsistence holder culturalists who fish, hunt, and gather from the forest in the Caribbean Sea. But since the beginning of contact with Europeans and probably before, they had an enduring tradition of, of trade and commerce and they're well known for being excellent traders. And there's two main groups of Kuna, those who live on the coral islands off the coast in the Caribbean Ocean uh, of, the, uh, of the Republic of Panama, and those who live in inland villages in the Darien, which is the eastern Panama uh, located on the border uh, with Colombia. And the Kuna maintain a strong sense of cultural identity, and they, uh, have a traditional political system of chiefs, and they have relative cultural autonomy in their Comarca lands. And Comarcas are the, are, the, are the name that we give to the indigenous lands that have been ceded to them uh, by the government through treaty. And they were able to engender this particular uh, uh, autonomy over their tribal lands 
in a revolution called the Dulé Revolution in 1925. And Jim Howe, he's an anthropologist who worked with the Kuna, uh, he wrote a book about their political system, and he titled it The People Who Would Not Kneel. And quite frankly, the Kuna liked the name of that book. They, 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 appreciate, uh, they appreciate Jim's title because that's the kind of people they think they are, and that, is their, and that has been their political strategy since the beginning of contact. About 70,000 Yuli Gayaga uh, speakers, Kuna speakers. And they're well known for their uh, Mola textile art, and it's an important source of, 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 of funds, of economic uh, influence. Okay. So Balboa arrives in the Darien in 1513, but in the late 1400s, the Spanish built the first European settlement on the continent of the New World in Cunayala land. It was a place called El Real de Santa Maria. Maria la Antigua, and it was built along Caribbean coast in the area inhabited by the Kuna. So the Kuna then have been in constant contact with Europeans, uh, yet they have maintained a strong sense of cultural identity and integrity. And Balboa is seen here claiming the Pacific Ocean um, uh, uh, for all of, uh, for all of Spain and the lands that were uh, uh, that touched the Pacific Ocean. So. He actually stood, he arrived at this place. We, we know the approximate location of where this was. He crossed over the Continental Divide from the Caribbean Sea, and he arrived here. It was a huge mud flat, so he didn't want to go out and symbolically claim all the land for Spain on a mud flat. So they waited for the 18-foot tide to come in, and then he went out and stood in the water. He says, this land belongs to the king and queen of Spain forever and a day, and anyone who doesn't believe this will taste the blade of my sword or something like that. And, uh, uh, and this included the entire Pacific Ocean, which I don't think he understood quite how large this place was. And there's been a number of contacts with the Kuna over the years. One of the most interesting was this guy, Lionel Wafer. In the late 1600s, he was uh, associated with some buccaneers who were raiding along the coast of Panama, and he got uh, hit by a poison arrow, and the Kuna took him in, and he spent a significant amount of time with them, and he was kind of uh, scientifically uh, uh, bent, and so he actually wrote about their natural history, their culture, their shamanism and their language and all kinds of things like this. So this was one of the first opportunities that Europeans got to appreciate uh, the more sophisticated aspects of indigenous life because he himself uh, spent a significant amount of time. And he created these beautiful plates that are some of the earliest graphic representations of Kuna culture from then the late 600s. And moving on in time, uh, we now arrive to the 1800s, and of course there were a number of surveys in Panama about where to put uh, the uh, potential canal that would be coming in decades in the future. And this is a, a, a lithographic plate of a Kuna village in, in the Darien, 1876, Armando Recluse expedition. Uh, he was an early, early explorer. And as you can see, the Kuna tradition lived in thatched roofed houses. They practiced subsistence horticulture and hunted and gathered from the nearby tropical forests and fished from the streams, rivers, and, and, and the Caribbean uh, Sea. However, from early times, they learned to be uh, shrewd traders, as we mentioned before. And you can see on the map the approximate locations of the different comarcas in Panama, and circled in red are the three. Uh, 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 comarcas of the of the Cuna, uh, Comarca de Cuna Yala, uh, Comarca uh, Cuna de Madugandi, and Comarca Cuna de Wargandi. And so these are the three indigenous lands. So um, in Panama, indigenous cultures control about uh, one tenth of the geography of Panama, one tenth of the population, and of course they're caretakers of one of the largest tracts of old growth forest in. In, in Central America. As you can see, there are other indigenous groups in Panama, including the neighbors to the Kuna, which is the Embanawal Nun, 
uh, culture, and those are the folks that I spent most of my research and my time uh, working with uh, 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 as a cultural anthropologist. So these are histo some historic photographs that show uh, the lifestyle. You can see these are coral islands with white uh, beach sand and uh, thatched roof buildings. Uh, coconut palms are a very important source of income. Uh, they have been trading uh, coconuts uh, with Colombian traders, uh, especially for cloth to make molas for uh, many decades. And here is a historic scene of, of Acuna Village uh, before the invention of outboards and, of course, uh, the, um, uh, in the uh, 60s and 70s, outboard motors became popular, but there are still Cayucas or, uh, or boats with sails in Cunayala. See the mainland in the background to the right? That's where the Cuna have to go to hunt and to farm and to fish the freshwater streams. Uh, another close up of, of, of their uh, mode of transportation. So each one of these coconuts was worth a half dollar or peso. And so they are an important source of income for Kuna families, even to this day. And here is a picture of Kuna folks. As you can see, the women are dressed in traditional dress. And the blouse that the woman to the left is wearing is a mola blouse. You can see the mola on the back. And uh, they also uh, have pierced noses. It's, uh, uh, which are kind of going out of style in the modern era, but long noses are thought to be beautiful. And uh, um, uh, let's see, the, the Kuna word means the golden people. So uh, you can see why they might consider themselves the people who would not kneel if you were the golden people. Uh, here's a, a picture of a, a extended family group. Notice that the Kuna women uh, wearing very traditional dress, which they wear to this day, and the men wearing uh, Western clothes, which is, uh, which is, uh, which is not surprising. Uh, uh, for decades, uh, Kuna men have been wearing Western Western clothes. Um, here's a picture of a village scene. Uh, notice the albino in the woman. Albinism uh, is common among the Kuna. They have the highest rate of albinism in the world. So their uh, rate of albinism has been a, a number of scientists studied it. So a picture of a Kuna family. Notice that as the uh, boys get older, they adopt Western dress. And as the girls get older, they adopt traditional dress. Notice the gentleman on the right. This gentleman is a chief or a cacique. And he's wearing the hat of wisdom. When you put on your hat, you put on wisdom. And so to go to Congress, uh, the, the males, they put on their hat, especially the leadership and caciques. And notice he's carrying a staff. This is no ordinary staff. This is a shaman staff that he uses to communicate with the spirit world. And now we get to molas. So I think the first thing to say about molas is that uh, they are reverse applique embroidery of multiple layers of cloth. And uh, each layer is peeled back and sewn in patterns to reveal the design underneath. And each blouse has two matching panels. So the mola design can be influenced by almost anything that a Kuna woman might see. Myths, spirits, cultural heroes, forest or marine creatures, or perhaps a design from a comic book or a can of baking powder or Coke bottle. Because of the complexity of its creation, each design must be well established and clearly visualized by the woman artist before she starts to go to work. And each mola has a front and a back and the pair has to be matched. So here you can see a matching pair of molas, and you can see tiny changes from the front to the back. A little different color variation, a little different design variation, 
but it is critical that the that the execution of the MOLA design have have themes in common. And you can see that in in this MOLA that represents most likely a sea creature. And every MOLA tells a story. So here is a wonderful story in the Neil and Parker book. I'll show you the reference where the moon child, which is what people who are albinos are called, has to go out and shoot this uh, flying reptile uh, in, in the heart because he's eaten the moon. And so in order to restore natural order from an eclipse, a moon child has to go out and shoot this supernatural arrow in, into the heart of the beast to cause it to release the moon. And that's documented in this particular, in this particular MOLA. So what we would like to do is we'd like to take a look at one MOLA in particular that I've highlighted from my collection. So every MOLA tells a story. So let's take a look at this MOLA and see how many details you recognize. So I'm going to give you a moment to take a look at what's going on here. Are you looking? Are you looking? Okay, you are looking. Okay, great. Okay, here we go. Are you ready? So what we want to do is we want to execute our anthropological, ethnographic powers of interpretation to take a look at what's going on in this MOLA. First, did you get the three feminine spirits? So in the center is a shamanic spirit woman. Her arms are outstretched. And below her, she's riding on the back of an aquatic feminine spirit who is swimming forcefully through the water. And above them, protecting them, overarching them, is a celestial feminine spirit. Notice we know that she's feminine because she has the same sort of hair of the other two spirits. And notice the hand of the central uh, uh, shamanic woman is touching the face of the celestial spirit woman. And just below her face, you can see her breasts. So these are three feminine spirits. Now, here we go. And the author of this MOLA has chosen to place them within a supernatural landscape. And she has surrounded that landscape with this outline. It's not round, it's not oval, it is this, ob it is this irregular shape, but this is what I would consider the supernatural portal or the new portal into the supernatural landscape. And of course, there is a collaborative and coordinated powerful movement towards the goal. Now we have no idea what the goal is, <clears throat> but whatever it is, they seem very, very intent on getting there. And they're working together. As you, the, you can see the stroke forward by the aquatic feminine spirit through the water, very determined stroke. <clears throat> you can see the arching curve of the celestial feminine spirit's protection, uh, uh, encapsulating the two other, uh, uh, the two other feminine spirits. Are these resin? Are these resin? No doubt Kuna in Egypt had contact with the same ancient aliens. <laughs> okay. Yes. Okay. Thanks, Mike. Yeah. Okay. Well, good. By the way, you see these cubes to the left of me? Any of you guys that are going to give presentations that have high resolution slides, put your slides on those cubes, put them in the venue the day before and your slides will res correctly. How about that? That was a, uh, uh, that was a surprising, that, that worked so well. Because otherwise these were taking like five, six, seven seconds to res. Okay, look at the, uh, look at the mouths of these two uh, spirit women. Something's coming out of it. Maybe that is supposed to represent shouting, or maybe it represents sacred tobacco smoke. We don't know, we don't know, but it was obviously put there to represent and notice the aquatic uh, feminine spirit. She has not just one necklace, but two. But the others don't have necklaces. Why is that? Well, we don't know the answer to that either. And notice that the 
aquatic spirit has four fingers. So if you stretch your hands out in a forceful stroke, you have only uh, you have you have only four fingers showing, and that was of course the the mola maker's choice as well. But yet the protected celestial feminine spirit has five. So if you put your hands down as if you are are protecting something, you show five fingers. But if you're stroking through the water, you show four fingers. The mola maker she did this on purpose. This was not by chance. This was not by chance. I'm just you know use those details to appreciate how sophisticated the 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 vision of the mola maker was before she went to work and of course did you re did you see the the amulets around the the arms of the of the shaman uh, feminine spirit and those perhaps are power uh, amulets or something like that we we're not sure <laughs> uh, but uh is accompanied by two birds. Uh, these are probably uh, spirit helpers, okay? Animal spirit helpers. They look like parrots, uh, but we're not quite sure. Well, it says if you're holding your hands out and you say, go forth, you don't put your thumbs up. You tuck your thumbs in. So that's why she has four digits. I think that this was on purpose. And then notice that it's all set within a celestial landscape. Stars in four corners and one below. And that star below is not there by accident. She put it there on purpose. And so what this indicates to me is that this supernatural portal is taking place within a, a celestial domain uh, surrounded by stars. And notice that the the feminine spirit protecting them she has stars and the only star that is outside of of the feminine spirit's body or outside of the edges of the, of the portal is that one star uh, next to the bird on the left why is that why is that well i don't know i don't know now, notice the fine embroidery inside the birds and the heads and the body of the feminine spirits. And so that fills the space. The Kuna women's aesthetic are compelled to put stuff in the empty spaces. And then notice in the left and right, the triangles. Those triangles are there to uh, occupy, uh, occupy the space. And in the body of the aquatic uh, feminine spirit, is also uh, uh, rectangles or uh, parallel pipeds that actually fill, fill, fill the space. If you go to the exhibit at CVL, and I invite you all to go there at the community virtual library that we've uh, put up ab about the Embanon and the Kuna cultures, uh, there's a video of a Kuna woman making a mola, and she says that once she puts the uh, these space fillers in, the mola comes alive. And so those space fillers are the Kuna Mola's aesthetic uh, strategy for making the mola come alive. Okay, so there you go. The mola represents, presents a powerful spirit woman protected and enabled by her aquatic, terrestrial, and feminine spirit helpers as she soars across the water for her unknown mission. What does it all mean? Perhaps it is one of the many Kuna myths or a representation of a Kuna feminine culture hero, but it could just as well be a fanciful representation of an image adapted from a comic book. You would have to ask the masterful Kuna artist to be sure. Well, as you look at this mola now, I hope you see a lot more stuff than you did initially. And if you do, I would like to suggest that that is the power of interpretation. That is what anthropologists do as ethnographers. They attempt to appreciate the complexity and detail of, of culture and then interpret it in a way that we could potentially, uh, potentially understand. And so we go to the pair. So this mola is equivalently imbued with detail. And it happens to be the mola pair of the one that you just saw 
uh, previously, and we can subject it to an equivalent analysis, but we won't. <laughs> but I would like to say that the molas always come in, pa in matched pairs. So this is the front and the back. So this is a, a winged spirit uh, woman mola. This uh, masterfully executed mola may be an angel from uh, Christian iconography, but it is more likely a feminine winged spirit being that is uh, a spirit master of nature. Notice all the plant floral images, including the stamen and flower position in front of her as if it was an altar. She appears to be communicating with or praying to uh, spirits in the botanical domain. At least that's my interpretation. Now, this mola represents a traditional design. So mola artists exploit complex colored combinations uh, in this case, uh, bright orange and primary red and blue to get this powerful visual effect of, of movement and shimmery. And if you take a look, you can see the, uh, the detail of, of, of that effect uh, and you can see the colors. Notice that this red and orange uh, combination is quite common. And uh, in the last time I gave this talk, someone asked me, why are they all red? And so as you can see in molas, a uh, red is very common color, and it turns out that Vixa or Alana, or we uh, uh, Achiote in Spanish, we call it Anato in English, was a important body paint before the invention of Mola culture, and so it is a bright red orange. So I think that that may be one of the reasons why red is such a popular color for uh, Mola designs. Now here's the fifty cent piece, and you can see the uh, stitching and how complex the stitching uh, is in this uh, very finely executed mola. Now here you have another mola with the same uh, uh, similar shimmering color effect. Uh, this is also a traditional geometric design and as you can imagine there are many different kinds of molas but one of the most traditional are these geometric designs which I think also come from body paint. Another geometric design, similar uh, shimmering color effect, but in this case, orange, red, and blue color uh, combinations to create this uh, 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 to create this mold. Now, here's a similar color combination, but a zoomorphic. So this is a, a frog or a turtle, and notice that it's double-headed. This double-headed uh, design is very common. Uh, in, in molas. And this is also a traditional mola uh, design. And the double-headed uh, theme is quite common, as we'll see in a couple, uh, a couple other slides. Uh, here are, appears to be what might be a botanical uh, uh, mola, but it's probably not. These are probably spirit beings. Uh, six uh, spirit creatures. Notice again the double-headed theme. And if you look at the head, you will see two eyes and a nose, at least on the ones on the left and right. So this leads me to believe this is not a floral mola. It's not a botanical mola. It's not a geometric mola, but a mola of six uh, spirit beings, three creatures with double heads. Now, here we have a zoomorphic mola. Uh, uh, of a dog and, and perhaps a predatory bird. There are many predatory birds in Cunayala. The harpy eagle is the largest, but this is probably not a harpy because it doesn't have a crest. Uh, so this is probably some other kinds of, of eagle or, or a hawk and, and appears in, in combat uh, with a floppy-eared dog. So there are geometric molas, there are zoomorphic molas, there are botanical molas. Uh, and then there are uh, molas that are adapted from uh, any other kind of image that the mola maker might come into contact with. And here's an interesting example. <clears throat> this is a mola that comes from a polychrome pot, polychrome plate from co-clay culture, a prehistoric culture that is now extinct. And the co-clay ceramics or 
clay polychromes are some of the most sophisticated polychromes in 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 any uh, indigenous pottery throughout the world. And this particular design was adopted for Amola. So here we have prehistoric culture influencing uh, Mola design among a modern traditional uh, a modern traditional culture. And it also turns out to be <clears throat> a design that was used for one of the TV stations in Panama as well. Okay. Now, uh, we haven't talked too much about uh, modern culture because this is really about Mola art and aesthetics. But of course, Molas are an important source of, of income for the Kuna. And as you look at the screen, you can see this young girl uh, six, seven, or eight years old, and she's tending the store. If you look at the molas, you can see many of the molas have their pair. So I always try to buy molas, and the molas that you see represented here are mostly molas that I bought when I was a young man. And so they are, uh, many of them are, are antique molas. But uh, sometimes tourists come and they just buy one of the pair. So the pair gets separated forever. But you can see on the thatched wall that many of the molas come in pairs. Notice the shovel on the right. That shovel is a, not a shovel. That is a symbol of one of the political parties, one of the many political parties. in. So, of course, anything is a, a subject of, 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 a mola, of, of, of a mola design. Notice the crosses. Those are most likely Christian crosses in the right hand side. Oh, and by the way, if you think that this young lady is not going to drive a hard bargain, you've never dealt with a Kuna trader. This young girl will make sure she gets fair value for anything that she tell you. Guaranteed. And of course, the uh, on, in Kunayala, sometimes tour ships come to the islands, and so Kuna women sit out their molas on clotheslines and and stand around and, and bargain with the tourists. But the Kuna have very strict rules about engagement with outsiders. Uh, normally, except for a few isolated cases, you cannot spend the night in Kunayala unless specifically invited by the Congress. And, of course, you can see that they maintain many of their traditions, including wearing traditional dress, which is very distinctive when you walk on downtown Panama City. And, of course, I would like to make a couple recommendations for any of you folks that might want to look into the uh, Mola textile art or Kuna culture. The single best book on uh, Kuna culture is The Art of Being Kuna. Uh, layers of mean among the Kuna uh, uh, of of Panama, uh, and uh, if you wish to look specifically at traditional Kuna textile art, I'd like you to reco I'd like to recommend uh, this book, The Mola by Edith uh, Crouch, a good friend uh, of our family, and she's written an excellent book. One of the older books on uh, on, on on Mola design and, and Mola art is the Neil and Parker book. And it is this book that I took the picture of the moon child shooting the supernatural arrow into the heart of the, of the winged reptile. Now, in order to exhibit all of this stuff, the community virtual library has been uh, very generous in providing uh, space to build an exhibit. And we have uh, multiple portions of the exhibit. Uh, we have a, a gallery of molas, the hall of the big molas, and ethnography of the molas. But we also highlight some of my other uh, research with the Embana. And perhaps if the Science Circle is interested, we could talk about that on some other later date. And I invite you all to come to the ethnographic exhibit if you haven't. I will be there after this talk if you'd like to. Uh, visit, I'd be happy to escort you around. Uh, this is the Mola Gallery. 
and you can get copies of the mullahs if you wish. And uh, um, the, uh, the green sign that says the mullah gallery is a mullah giver. So you can click on it and get one of the 38 different mullah textiles if you are interested in doing that. So there we go. So I would just like to say uh, thank you to the Science Circle for for supporting this, and I hope that I have been able to transport you uh, to the rainforest of Cunial of Eastern Panama for a short moment, a place uh, where we can appreciate the feminine craftsmanship of Kuna visionary indigenous textile art and their rather complex aesthetics, and maybe, just maybe, provide you with a peek at a unique society whose traditions and cultural heritage, heritage represent an unbroken lineage into our own tribal past that existed for hundreds of thousands of years and has certainly played a key role in shaping our own cultural heritage and the nature of human consciousness. Thank you. Now, Baragon, did you ha have any questions for me? So I wasn't able to watch chat while I was talking. So if you do, uh, if if you do have any questions, uh, you, you'll probably have to repeat them in chat, or have Baragon voice them to me. Uh, hello. Yes, this is Baragon. Uh, so, uh, Bill, I did. I did just quickly want to uh, touch base. In the first uh, mula, um, there are upside down crosses, and I remember in uh, one of your other presentations, you mentioned that you know that's not necessarily a satanic image or or even Christian at all. And could you elaborate on that a little bit for us? Uh, well, of course, in mullahs, you see designs that are used throughout the world. And of course, the cross is a common design, not just to Christianity. And uh, if you remember, you can see here in the picture behind me that the crosses that she's wearing, they're almost symmetrical in size. And I would consider those to be uh, power amulets of the female shaman. Uh, so that's how I interpret that. I, this doesn't appear to be anything from Christian iconography. Okay. Okay, uh, so there is a question from uh, I, I want yes. I have a question. Oh yes. Uh -huh. uh -huh. In continuation of what Baragon was saying, uh, do you know how old um, these designs are? Because I would like to know if there is a possibility that they were influenced by the conquest. Oh, absolutely. Uh, the early geometric molas probably are direct descendants from uh, body painting, and they used uh, they use uh, wooden rollers to create uh, complex designs on on their bodies. But um, as you can imagine, from the late 1400s, the Kuna had contract contact with European culture. So molas, there are many molas that have any number of different kinds of, of, of iconography from Western culture. I've seen Batman molas, Superman molas, Spider-Man molas are popular. <laughs> and uh, almost any subject is suitable for inclusion in a mola design. But of course, uh, many molas represent Kuna Miss, uh, or many molas represent the geometric designs as well, or zoomorphic designs that they get from the rainforest around them. But anything, I've seen a baking powder uh, mola from the uh, iconic uh, head of an Indian person on baking powder. I've seen that made into a mola. So, of course, uh, Western culture has creeped into mola designs in oh so many ways. Um, uh, Bill, uh, kind of, Continuing uh, with that thought, uh, with um, uh, sort of European 
infiltration into the new world. Uh, do horses have uh, much of an influence in uh, Kuna culture, or is it sort of too forested and jungly for horses to have really, um, you know, found a, found a found a home uh, with the Kuna? Well, that's a good question because the horse was well uh, adapted and integrated, well integrated into the culture of the Plains Indians from the earliest time. But indigenous people in Panama, uh, for the most part, are focused on the domestic animals of chickens, ducks, and pigs, like traditional people everywhere in the world. Uh, horses and cattle are not common among the Kuna and the Embana. Among the Nobe, which are in western Panama, uh, some Nobe families have horses for transportation, but in the rainforest, uh, neither the Kuna, uh, the Embana, or Waonan, uh, ge generally speaking, do not raise horses or cattle. And that's a very important concept because cattle require huge amounts of deforested land for pasture in order to maintain them. And so uh, indigenous people have not adapted cattle culture and with it the associated horse culture. Right. That's uh, that's part of the pressures on the on the Amazon forest is to deforest it for uh, for cattle grazing. Um, uh, uh, Ursa Electra asks, uh, when did the first modern molas appear? Did they wear clothes in the 19th century and before? And I'm, I'll follow up that too. Like sort of how old are the oldest molas that we know of? That's a good question. Uh, mola culture came into play in the 1800s. Um, um, before that, the indigenous people uh, went bare-breasted. The Embana to this day go bare-breasted when, when they are in their, alone in their community. And the Kuna went bare-breasted as well. And so with the advent of missionaries and, and so forth, it created a sense of embarrassment, I think, for women to be bare-breasted. Uh, and so the Kuna adopted this blouse strategy, and it has a direct descendant and direct relationship with body painting. And that's why the geometric molas are some of the earliest molas that we know of from the 1800s. However, the Embana, people who live next door, they're bare-breasted to this day, and they use the same body paints that the Kuna use. Uh, the purple uh, body paint that comes from Genipa Americanum, and the bright orange red body paint that comes from Bixa Orellana. And these are the two body paints that you see throughout the Amazonian era to this day. But, uh, I think that uh, molas were a response to uh, the embarrassment of Western observers like missionaries who came and visited them in the 1800s. And Mist asked a question here in chat about the evolution of wearing a hat to indicate leadership is, is interesting. Uh, they're not the only culture to consider the hat the formal symbol of 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 political leadership and of course uh in in among the kuna it's considered the hat of wisdom so when you put on your hat and go to congress you're putting on the solemn responsibility of being wise and making political decisions for, that benefit your community and i think that this was uh uh probably influenced uh, by the 1700s and the 1800s where it was a tradition for Western people, Western men to wear hats, which has gone out of style these days. But the Kuna still maintain uh, uh, this culture uh, and the symbolism of the hat as representing uh, wisdom, and they put it on when they go to Congress. Baragon, something else? Uh, not for me. Oh, I see. Here's another one from uh, Mist. Discuss the difference between Hmong and Kuna textile art. Well, Hmong and Kuna textile art look a lot of same because it's both an applique method. The Kuna textile art is a reverse applique, 
And the Hmong uh, textile art is a positive applique instead of reverse applique. But they both have similar kinds of geometric designs. They both attempt to represent scenes from uh, traditional life. And, and so they are completely separated. Uh, so there is no historical influence between the two groups. But they have both invented a textile art that has many characteristics. Good, that's a very good question. Something else? Anything else? Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you all so much for coming out in the pandemic, uh, spending some time. I hope you enjoyed our our little our little trip to Kunayala, and I hope that it helps you uh, appreciate the complexity and the visionary art. Of, of, of Kuna women. And please don't hesitate to come visit us at the exhibit in the community virtual library. We'd be happy to show you around. And thank you so much to Chantel and, and the Science Circle team for putting this on and giving us an opportunity to talk about uh, anthropology as social science and the process of interpretation and folk art among the Kuna. Thank you.